open it up so we can start allowing folks in now. And Vance, then, have you recovered from Easter? I am still trying. <laughs> it has been, um, you know, certainly, certainly a uh, an interesting Easter. So I'm trying to recover at this point. Yeah, you know, it, was, it was certainly less obviously elaborate than anything we've ever done, but it was yeah. just much work, you know. Uh, so it, it wasn't easier because it was smaller scale. No, no, I don't think so. Um, I'm getting this set up now, so it will go out. All right, as folks are joining us, we're giving a few moments just for people to join and then uh, getting it live streaming here uh, in just a moment. So folks that want to join us there, um, I'm going to try to pull up, um, you know, both um, screens and, and keep up with questions that are being asked on Facebook as well. So I'll, I'll let you know if there are any of those. Great. One more quote there. Perfect. Okay. There we go. Okay, so we should be live there. We've got some folks in here. Um, hi, Reverend Diane Fisher. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I, I see your uh, chat there. Um, so we'll, we'll get started here in just a moment. Um, we just went on uh, line um, with Facebook. And so I'm not sure we didn't get a lot of chance to promote this and let folks know. So we might not have a huge live audience up front uh, as we go through. Um, but, and then more viewership after the, um, the broadcast is over. So we'll, we'll um, do our best to answer questions uh, while we're in the, the broadcast and then after as well. Um, so, um, so we're continuing the conversation um, of, you know, that we started a few weeks ago now, uh, the church's response to crisis. And we started talking about some of the similarities in, in the AIDS crisis and what we're dealing with now in COVID and what we could learn and how we could uh, help respond in this day and time. And, we're, uh, and, and that's across all communities and communities of faith and how we can really come together. Um, you know, and, and the thing is just very interesting and, and uh, bleak as we look at the numbers. Uh, we're at now, over, you know, I think, just over or just under 2 million confirmed cases uh, with over 130,000 deaths. Um, and, and when we see this in this ongoing prolonged time, um, yeah, I can certainly understand where we're, we're you know, just getting fatigue. We're getting battle fatigue or, or news fatigue and, and just trying to find ways to continue to, to live um, in our present realities. Um, so I remind us uh, the same thing that Reverend Ziegler told us the very first conversation we had is when we find ourselves in those moments where we're anxious or when things just seem really, really tough to stop and remember to breathe. It does take time to do that. And so thank you so much, Karen, uh, Reverend Ziegler. I will continue to, uh, to lean on that because that has been such a great help to me and so many folks. Um, just remember to stop and breathe. Uh, so we're joined today by Reverend Karen Ziegler uh, and Reverend Jim Matulski. So thank you all both very much for being here. Um, this is one of the, the break-off conversations to talk about uh, a bit about policy and politics and why that is so important uh, for us to talk about when we're looking at things like COVID or a present crisis. Um, it's easy. Uh, I can certainly relate to this. I'll speak from my, my own experience. Um, that uh, initially, uh, several years ago, when I would hear anybody talk about politics in the middle of any sort of bad thing going on or crisis, I would immediately just shut down and like, okay, I just can't deal with that. I don't want to talk about it. So I want to, you know, really give us a chance to talk about why that is so important. 
uh, why policy and politics matter and why we need to be talking about them now, uh, why we don't need to wait, why we don't need to, to, to uh, go beyond the crisis to really start that conversation. And so, so what that looks like, um, one thing that, that somebody has said, a few folks have said recently, is that uh, COVID-19 or coronavirus is an equal opportunity virus or equal opportunity disease. And while it may be true that it does not matter uh, who you are, you can contract the virus, I think that it is absolutely um, something we should understand and see that it does not impact us equally. When we look at the death and mortality rates, it is not impacting people equally. There are people who are being disproportionately impacted that, particularly here in America. Um, I can't speak for, for all of the countries. I do know here in America, we're seeing a much higher mortality rate among Black Americans and, and Hispanics who are uh, impacted by coronavirus. Um, just a couple of the, the latest numbers that were out there today, um, in Illinois, uh, they had 42% of the deaths were Black Americans, uh, while only 15% of their population uh, is, is Black Americans. In Louisiana, one of the, the hardest hit areas right now, 70% um, uh, of the deaths in, in Louisiana are Black uh, communities, and uh, they only make up 32% of that population. Uh, in New York City, they've released their numbers that 34% uh, of, the his, uh, of the deaths have been Hispanic community members, uh, while that made up 29% of the population. And uh, uh, Black folks in New York City, 28% of the death rate, uh, with 22% of that being the, the um, population. So it's very clear that, that this is not an equal opportunity impact virus. Um, so. Reverend Ziegler and Reverend Matulski, I'll let y'all start uh, just telling us first and foremost, why is this so important for us to really talk about politics right now? We love this subject. <laughs> Jim, you want to start? Uh, well, I do want to say that not everyone thinks that politics uh, is a topic to be avoided at all costs. Uh, yes. I, I mean, we probably come from different religious traditions where it's emphasized in different ways. Now, I grew up as a Catholic, which would be the first church to say, oh, we're not political, but they're all over uh, abortion uh, and other issues that are important to them. So I, I think it's a myth that, you know, religion and politics should be kept separate. Um, for me, my faith has been refined and also has been an asset that I bring to the world of uh, politics and policy. Uh, and MCC is certainly... Uh, on, uh, by definition, a political church. We always have been. A hundred gay people gathering in a room and calling themselves Christians in 1970, that was political. It was news. Mm -hmm. So I, I think part of it, I'm hoping we can engage what's wrong with being political and what's wrong with uh, having our faith be a basis for which we participate in the public realm. Mm -hmm. We know some things. And we particularly know some things that will be useful in this uh, crisis. And I think the one thing that we can't say enough is universal health care for all people uh, and get rid of the stupid insurance uh, as a privilege uh, system. It's not serving us, anybody, uh, whoever who gets sick, who doesn't have it. And I, I think it's a, it's a huge uh, marker about the dysfunction of how we administer health or public health uh, in our country. You know, we're shocked. We're saying, oh my God, how could this happen in the United States? People around the world are also saying that too. But what really shocks them is how little we uh, invest in healthcare for all. And, and we have the most expensive healthcare system in the world. We spend a huge, the hugest amount of our um, gross national product of, of any country. And yet, uh, I think, what is it, 87 million Americans have no health insurance. And without health insurance, people die. So, so I just want to go back for a second before we go forward about healthcare, which is that this aversive reaction that we might have to, like the word politics, I think we're thinking about, oh, this is a place where I might have fights with my parents or other people, and I want to avoid this conflict. Mm 
-hmm. And I just, I just want to lift up, um, you know, Moses, who was asked in his heart by God to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. I mean, talk about walking directly into conflict. You can't get much more direct than that, right? And then, you know, I think about Jesus. You know, sometimes I think the reason why Jesus uh, didn't avoid his crucifixion was because he really wanted to show people the truth about their leaders, that Pontius Pilate would actually crucify him for preaching good news, you know? And so he, on Palm Sunday, he just rode right in a triumphant, you know, palms and everything. He, he was walking directly into conflict with the principalities and powers with the most powerful people, knowing that he was going to his eventual death. So conflict is something that people of faith have always been called to. And like the people of Israel, we are in some sense enslaved unless we stand up to the principalities and powers. And we are, we're not following Jesus if we're afraid to look at how our mandate to feed the poor, to heal the sick, to house the homeless, to welcome the stranger, to release the prisoner, how that puts us into direct conflict with so many of our elected officials and so many of the people who would rather have a piece of the pie than to share the pie with everyone. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, I, so I think that, uh, that that theologically is a reason why we have to really dive into this topic. And healthcare and healthcare disparities is a great place to start. Um, and and we, could, we could mine that for quite a while. You know, we've had mm -hmm. decades, centuries of uh, of an economic system built by slaves, built by people of color that then systematically took money away from black Americans uh, and or never gave it to them in the first place. The wealth of black Americans is decreasing. So about by 2050, they will have no wealth. Hmm. And the, you know, the, the poorest Americans have negative wealth. Many of them are certainly people of color. Negative wealth, they're, they have debt. Um, whereas the richest 10% of Americans have 76% of the wealth. Hmm. So, so the poorest people in this country die of poverty. Um, and, and we're dying of poverty before the virus. Right, already. Now, we're a little ashamed that the light is being shown on it. Yes. Uh, but any of the issues that we mentioned healthcare as a privilege and not a human right uh, the, uh, uh, is, a, is a good example of that. Uh, but there are others, the, um, uh, the lack of empathy that uh, is characteristic of our political culture um, is, is really influencing what's happening. If I'm not deliberately affected by it, I'm not going to become involved in, in mitigating the, uh, the pain or the difficulty that the people who are suffering it have. If this virus becomes perceived as something that is a disease that only terminally affects poor people, uh, it will determine uh, how we respond to it because uh, it will not get the same uh, level of attention that uh, it merits. And that worries me. So here in uh, California, we're seeing this week, nursing home deaths, um, and, and nearby nursing home to me, 10 people died. Oh my God, how did 10 people die in a nursing home? And part of what's being revealed is um, that these nursing homes were substandard and not been appropriately supervised, uh, or there was no oversight from the state because the people who access them uh, are, are poor. So of course, these become a nexus for disease um, and uh, I mean, the, the nursing home deaths are one example. It's not everyone in all nursing homes. It's the ones that predictably uh, did not, do not have uh, adequate care uh, where this is happening. Um, Governor Newsom just announced that, uh, I think it was $125 million is being made available to undocumented workers who are now unemployed uh, because the whole federal package uh, excludes any uh, fi uh, financial assistance for working people uh, who are undocumented. It's crazy. Right. I mean, right. it's actually, think about that. It's, a, it's such a slap in the face 
uh, to them who pay, to, and they pay taxes already. Right. That's political to decide that a class of people right. uh, cannot receive a benefit that others are receiving. Um, so, well, uh, yes, and these are some of the very essential workers, meaning essential to our lives workers mm -hmm. right now. They are the lowest paid workers. Many of them do not even make a minimum wage. Um, and also, I, it's really important to look at the way the, the White House has been demonizing immigrants, you know, for three and a half years. Mm -hmm. So we have this whole economic system that was built to keep a few white men very wealthy. And it's been working very well. It's not a broken system. It's a system that's working exactly the way it was set up to act. Like the CARE Act that was recently passed overwhelmingly benefits millionaires. You know, we, we hear, oh, this is great. This is aiding us all. Overwhelmingly benefits millionaires, if you look at the numbers. The tax cut that was passed by the Senate um, that the Republican Party is so happy about, it went 83% of that went to the wealthiest. Um, very few people, more uh, higher than the richest 10%. So, but this is what our system was set up to do, to exploit some people of color, some poor people who are doing the work at the bottom and, and, and all the money is sent up to those few people who are living on dividends and, and making a whole lot of money. It's structured that way. And it really isn't a, a, a question of Democrat or Republican because sometimes the Democrats have been the good guys, sometimes the <laughs> Republicans have been the good guys when you look at it through history. But it's really important to look at which elected fish officials are speaking up for the poor and the right. oppressed, because those are the people as Christians that we need to make sure get into office. Because the people that are doing what Pontius Pilate and Pharaoh would like to have done, and there are plenty of those, we have to resist those people by voting them out of office. And that's one way that churches, big churches, small churches can all, um, can all take part in getting out the vote mm -hmm. and spreading the word that, you know, Trump won by very few votes in very few states. And most of those states were states that um, Obama won in 2008 and 2012. The stakes could not be higher for us in this coming election for trans people, for gay people, mm -hmm. um, and for people of color, mm -hmm. maybe especially. Well, and I want to question that notion and I understand why we have it, that it's not an issue of Democrat versus Republican. Uh, in some ways, now more than ever, uh, the parties are defining their identities right. uh, in ways that are impossible to ignore. Right, um, yeah, right, right. It just, it well, means, uh, right now, that's true. It's just if you go back 50 years ago, it might not be the same, you know? Yes, right now, you're absolutely right. And so, yeah. as uh, like, who is our most outspoken advocate for universal health care. To my mind, it was uh, Bernie uh, of the candidates. Right. And there are others were supportive on a spectrum and some very, very much so. But when he drops out to support Biden, which is, I understand, essential in order to secure a democratic victory, uh, we lose a voice in the public discourse advocating for universal health care. Uh, it was disappointing to me to see that happen. Uh, and if no one else is doing that, because are the churches bringing uh, up the issue of universal health care all the time? Is it closely associated with us? The people pass the Christian church and go, oh my God, there's such rabid advocates of universal health care for all people. You know, but Jesus no, was an advocate of that. <laughs> <laughs> but but the, with the religious voice right now in the political arena is, uh, we have First Amendment rights to gather uh, for our church services, no matter what. It's like, it's, they're embarrassing us. They uh, are. And we can't allow them to be the only ones. So I don't know how that's gonna play out, but I, I do think at some point we may have to say, uh, Republican and Democrat, it, it's a marber around a variety of liberation issues that we care about. I, I do uh, agree with you that right now, uh, anyone who is a person of color or an LGBTQ person or a poor person We've got to put our, our all of our energy into getting Democrats in the White House, flipping the Senate, 
keeping the house. And, you know, what's happened, none of this happened by accident. You know, um, this was a plan, like the, the state houses that have been taken over in North Carolina and Wisconsin, the power grabs, the gerrymandering, this was all done so that these few rich men and corporations could stay in power. While all over the world, indigenous people are fighting for their land, um, all over the world, people are dying because they don't have health care or food. And I don't really understand how people can consider themselves Christian and not be fighting in the political arena. Um, one thing that um, I think is, is probably appropriate to, to, to interject here if we can, uh, Reverend uh, Carmen Amos uh, pointed out something. And I think um, you know, with the stimulus checks that just came out with the CARE uh, Act, um, it's, it's a good moment to talk about this too. Uh, she says uh, that the aversion to politics is compounded by an aversion to socialism. Um, right. and, and since the values of socialism are so intricately uh, intertwined with these conversations about u uh, universal health care and wealth disparity, um, so, so what do you say about that? Because we've got the, the CARE Act that came out, we've got uh, stimulus checks that came out, and also one thing I just saw this afternoon just before we got on this call is that uh, those uh, um, stimulus checks that are going out are now uh, at risk of being taken uh, by private debt collectors uh, that, that they're not protected from. Uh, there's a loophole in the, the law, and so they're not protected from private uh, debt collectors like uh, health care. Uh, and some other things that, that there may be out there. So, so some Americans that are getting that may end up be, uh, losing it. So, uh, but, but to, to this aversion to politics and aversion to social, uh, socialism, what do you say to that? Aversion to socialism. I really want to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, certain people, I won't mention any names, are using the word socialism mm -hmm. As a, a boogeyman, a scare tactic. Oh, socialism, it's so bad. Well, let me tell you about socialism. Socialism is the corporate bailouts that we're doing every single day, some of which we talked about. Socialism is $649 billion going to the fossil fuel companies. $649 billion every single year from the United States budget. Um, we, we keep bailing out these billionaires and corporations so that they can keep uh, giving the richest people more and more and more money. Meanwhile, um, you know, socialism, like look what happened at Easter when the brokenhearted followers of Jesus, you know, realized that he was risen. What did they do? They shared everything. They shared everything. Nothing was held in common. That's directly from the Bible. They shared meals together. They made sure everybody was okay. That is socialism. Mm -hmm. And uh, don't let the people who are billionaires tell you it's bad. While meanwhile, they're spending 53 cents of every federal dollar on having eight, you know, the military budget. Arms dealers, that money goes to arms dealers. So it's propaganda. It's propaganda, and it's not true, and it's just trying to make us vote for uh, Republicans. And there are Christians that have been associated with socialism. Tons uh, of them. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus was pretty socialist, I would say. Right, but even the more modern forms that are. Yes, Dorothy Day. Dorothy that's Day. That's what I was thinking of. Uh, there are American Christians who say, "Oh, they see a natural connection." It, it is. Uh, it's a communal approach to problem solving, partly. It's a little simple, but, uh, well, we believe in that. We don't believe in s s siloed individual uh, responses. Uh, so I think we have to say the word socialism and not be afraid of it. Mm -hmm. uh, socialism, 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 there, you know. Uh, it's not evil. Uh, it, it, so uh, but, saying that, uh, uh, I don't even know why... Uh, liberal Democrats, we had Democratic candidates, all names and names, the gay ones, the gay one, uh, <laughs> right. uh, who was red baiting. And I know, I know, it drove me crazy. I want to say right. young man, <laughs> young man, <laughs> <laughs> we did not fight a revolution so that you could uh, criticize. Be a moderate. We did not yeah. fight a revolution so you could be a moderate. <laughs> yes, the position yourself as appealing to Republicans. So this, I know it's uh, perhaps childish, but I'm not quite yet willing to surrender what Democrat and Republican means, because I think we have to 
exercise their influence in the Democratic Party uh, to make sure that it doesn't become solely centrist um, and unresponsive then uh, to the liberation concerns that we're, that we're seeing and raising. Yeah. Well, one of the things we did this year um, at, at uh, St. John's is we, we entered into this notion of reclaiming, uh, taking some things back that had been taken from us. Uh, I love your and, website. I think that you have a big uh, statement right at the front. Yes, yes, we reclaiming connection. But not yes. homophobic religion. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we decided to do that. And, and so a lot of what I think and what I'm hearing in this is that if we can reclaim some of these words, reclaim some of these ideas, reclaiming uh, what politics means, reclaiming what socialism is, Good. reclaiming even what Republican and Democrat mean, because Good. I think you're both right. We're in a position where those things have become so um, negative and so controversial that, that we just want to avoid them at all costs. Right. And so I think being able to reclaim it and say, you know what, the, this doesn't have to be bad. We, we need to interject ourselves into this to be able to, um, uh, to, to live and, and to move forward. And we're uh, adding in uh, Reverend Diane Fisher as a, um, a panelist as well. She joined us uh, here in just a second. I'm going to unmute her microphone. So Reverend Diane, are you here with us? I am. Hi. Thank you for Hi, joining. I just start my video. Yeah. I didn't realize I was coming on, but yes. Hi. Uh, <laughs> hi. I uh, I am appalled at the the cost of healthcare in the United States. I'm a, appalled by who can access that healthcare yeah. and the quality of healthcare you can access depending on who you are. Uh, what your zip code is. Um, this, it's not just healthcare, but right now, that's what we're focusing on. I lived in a country with uh, a fair amount of socialism and with universal healthcare. I'm Canadian and loved it. Loved it. I didn't have the horror stories people talk about. You had insurance when you went to the hospital, you went because you were sick and it cost you nothing. You just went and it was taken care of. Here, people are making the decision not to go in and get tested, not to go to the hospital because they're afraid of the kind of debt they will leave their families. Right. And that is sinful yeah. in ways that it should not happen that a person does, it does, makes the decision to die. Yes, yes. Um, so that their families won't have debt. Uh, yes. It's horrifying. It's horrifying. Yeah. Leading cause of bankruptcy in this country, medical debt. Ridiculous. It's crazy. Yeah. So we have, have, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, well, we have contributions to, to make to these conversations as religious people. Uh, we, what, what did we learn in the gay movement? Partly, they were very willing, or we were very willing, to surrender our moral positions, uh, in a sense, and to say, r religious people are this, but gay people are secular, and you know we are not. Uh, we have more exalted ideas. It, it, it never was true that it was religion versus homosexuality, and uh, it was. Uh, uh, there were supportive people who were religious. I guess I want to say, we need to articulate a religious voice that relentlessly advocates for all of the issues we've been talking about uh, and not surrender that to only the religious right or, or to silence. Silence is even worse. You know, there's very little thoughtful discourse right now. And we're, it's still new, I realize that, but uh, on what's happening with this virus, the, the only religious stuff is scary to me. Um, this is a time to be not just advocates for, but aggressive, relentless advocates uh, for the social justice issues that coronavirus is revealing. Mm -hmm. As religious people, shameless religious people, you know, waving our Bibles, we should be saying, Jesus said this, right. and holding uh, our politicians accountable. Right, right, right. Mm. Mm. Um, 
so with with that, we're talking about health care a, a great deal, and I think that's probably the biggest uh, thing that we're noticing right now is how how uh, disproportionately this is impacting certain communities and how years and years of um, lack of attention, lack of care. I think it was uh, was maybe Reverend Steve Peters who pointed out in one of the very first calls, uh, or maybe it was you, uh, Reverend Tulsky, I can't remember, but somebody pointed out that um, this virus was going to point out who's being cared for, um, and, and it was going to do that. So as we're talking about uh, um, on, on the healthcare front, um, we see things uh, on a larger stage uh, from a worldwide perspective. We see things like our uh, now taking away or threatening to take away money from the World Health Organization. Right. Um, we see things like that. And, and Reverend Ziegler, at the, the first call, you talked about uh, how defunding had impacted during the Reagan administration uh, and then led into the AIDS crisis and then some of the defunding that took place during the last three years under the president administration and what impacts that has had here now with COVID. Um, so do you want to, uh, maybe all of you shed some light on what that's looked like for you um, initially with the AIDS crisis and with the Reagan administration and what we're seeing today? Yeah, I, I can start that because, uh, you know, if I was in New York in the 80s, if the city or the state or the federal government had acted instead of just, you know, doing nothing essentially for years and years until we the activists really forced them to act. We, we see how important it is, uh, city, state, and federal government in responding to these crises. And of course, in a global pandemic, um, we need the World Health Organization. Um, and, and so starting in 1980, this is really important to understand, the federal government became gradually dismantled by Republican administrations and the Democratic administrations didn't do much to stop it, but this has really escalated, escalated that the dismantling of the federal government and we're seeing that effect right now. And also such a weak president uh, who's, you know, I, I won't talk about his mental health issues, but the World Health Organization, he's just looking for someone to blame. He's, he's desperate and I would suggest that everyone go to, um, the internet and look up, um, uh, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain and you'll get the four minute clip of the Wizard of Oz when <laughs> he gets busted by Dorothy. You know, <laughs> that's exactly what we're seeing. That's what we saw a few days ago with President uh, Trump at the news conference, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Clearly nothing there um, except bravado. And, and so, um, you know, I think Jim's right. The, the Democrats in, in our elected officials have been trying to bring money to the people, have been trying to bring programs to the people. While meanwhile, this president, the GOP Senate, um, has been steadily rewarding billionaires. And me, you know, meanwhile, uh, uh, confirming under Trump 193 right-wing federal judges, and we'll be paying for that for a long time. Yeah. Well, Trump's uh, intrusion is the only word I can think of into the World Health Organization funding uh, <laughs> on behalf is one of the, just like, I don't know if it's the dumbest or the craziest thing I've seen. Craziest, it's the craziest uh, it, during it, a pandemic. And because global. aren't always so aware of what's happening globally, uh, it, may, it may not even be on our radar to the extent that it should be. It's, it's horrible that he did this. And you know, our own aid in AIDS internationally uh, was tied often uh, to abstinence only uh, strategies. If you wanted right. American money uh, right. in many places, you had to embrace abstinence only, which is ridiculous. Right wing uh, influence, right? And it, was, Bush. It, was religion. It, was, it was religion that did that. So even what's happening around uh, reproductive rights in the yes. nation is really important right now. Is it uh, yes. the state now, is it maybe in Louisiana, can't get an abortion? Right, Texas. Uh, uh, I mean, because of the coronavirus, there are these yes. emergency health uh, uh, measures. Yes. How crazy is that? You yes. know, uh, we, uh, the, the, our religion should be functioning to increase our awareness and to increase our sense of agency yes. about our ability to change it. If it makes us resigned to it 
or is silent about it. If you, yes. you know, go to church on this last Sunday, I know it's Easter, but it was Easter. And precisely, if, if we weren't addressing these issues and trying to keep it spiritual, you know, well, this is on, you know, Easter, not on Easter. Let's talk about resurrection. You know, let's talk about, you know, comforting the sick. Or the, if we're not also integrating these right. issues, we're not doing our jobs. Right, right. right. We're complicit. Right. Right. Who's getting crucified now? Who is Pontius Pilate right now? Uh, yeah, that, that's what we need to be talking about. And, uh, you know, just the World Health Organization offered the United States testing and we turned it down. The Trump administration turned it down. That's why we don't have testing. Um, the, the Trump administration said, oh, no, we'll develop our own and, you know, couldn't manage to do it. The World Health, Health Organization sounded the alarm long before the Trump administration. So for him to blame them now is crazy. And just one other thing is that's a, that's a congressional appropriation. The president is not legally able to stop a congressional appropriation. We've been down this road several times. Mm -hmm. That may be another lawsuit. I don't know what's going to happen, but he can't just say money that's been appropriated by Congress, I'm holding on to. That's what happened with uh, uh, what all the events that precipitated the impeachment. He cannot do that. Mm -hmm. But he might be able to get away with it. Just because he can't do it doesn't mean that he won't be able to do it. Uh, because right, because the, sen the GOP senators will, will let him get away with anything, apparently. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy and frightening, actually. I yeah. think that the part as well that we've seen as a result of all this is what's happened to the environment tied mm -hmm. into yes. all of this and we've seen the environment now getting better but what's to say that because we've so dismantled the environment that it didn't just create a, a way for this virus to be transmitted much easier um, we have just shut down so many of the things that that uh, the funding of things that would help with the environmental um, situation in this country and around the world, uh, pulling out of those kinds of things we've added to the problem. And what we're doing here is we're adding to the problem. It's the same sort of trajectory. The difference is now we're seeing people just devastated by this disease and we're seeing the environment actually bound back brilliantly. Well, actually, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm really glad you brought that up because, you know, we think the virus is bad, killing millions and millions of people. Climate change, climate crisis is worse mm -hmm. and will kill more billions. We already have billions and billions of refugees. People are already dying from this. And, and this is because of the entrenched interests of the global oil companies. That's $5 trillion a year, according to the International Monetary Fund. They want that money. They're getting that money from various governments um, and they're holding all of the rest of us and the earth and its creatures hostage because of their greed. Yeah. And only, only all of us rising up to say, we, we no, no, we're going to stand up for the earth and her creatures and all the people, you know, especially the people who can't speak for themselves. I think it's all connected, no matter it's how we look. Also connected. Right. Yes. Very, very important. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I want to bring us back to MCC for a moment and mm -hmm. our existence as a gay church as a highly politicized identity and calling. Yeah. Um, the, I've been rereading the Mar Martin Duberman book, uh, and he's a socialist uh, <laughs> historian. Um, has the gay. Biblical movie, scholar, right? Uh, has the gay. Oh, movie, no, Martin, uh, right. Martin right. Duberman, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so he's a socialist. Uh, Marxist historian, and he has a long history of writing about people who have been social change uh, people. But he, in this book, he talks about the early roots of the gay movement in the 1960s that was specifically associated with socialist theory, feminist theory, uh, theories of uh, redistribution of uh, uh, assets, uh, all kinds of things that were at the root of a gay movement but by the time we're fighting for marriage equality and uh, gays in the military, all traces of that, uh, the radical roots have disappeared. We got co-opted. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so this is what he says about uh, 
what's necessary. The overwhelming majority of gay people, unlike those in Gay Liberation Front, a group from the 60s, uh, remained closeted. Their energy bent on avoiding detection. They sought to go unnoticed, to get along. And they silently scoffed at those who blatantly paraded their dissent. Or in the case of prominent early homophile activists like Frank Kameny or Barbara Giddings, genuine heroes in the context of what was possible in their own day, openly deplored Gay Liberation Front's, Front's countercultural nonsense. Yet in the face of widespread hostility, Gay Liberation Front, that socialist group, persisted, somehow persuaded that a small group of sufficiently dedicated and vocal uh, could set a generating political agenda, or at the least plant the seeds for the later emergence of a larger progressive force. Vociferous and demanding, Gay Liberation Front announced uh, the advent of a new kind of queer, boisterous, uncompromising, hell-raising. <laughs> and I, I love that because in, in just one paragraph, he reminds assimilated gay people who could be the people who are not gonna suffer in the end too much uh, uh, from this virus. I mean, everyone's gonna suffer a lot different, but some people right. will suffer more than others. Right. And if people get through it and right. it's not devastating, Right. They can't stop caring right. about the people who um, uh, who did not survive it, right? right? And I think that's part of what we bring as gay people. When we assimilated and tried to pretend that we are just like other people, right, uh, right, we lost our empathy as well as our ability to form meaningful coalitions, right. So there's a lot of discourse in the 1960s and 70s in the gay movement about race about uh, uh, gender, and that got eclipsed somehow. This is an opportunity for us to uh, reclaim our own radical roots as a movement and say, you know, this is not just about getting through or making sure that people don't lose their homes. What about the people who don't have homes? You know, in San Francisco, uh, there's, I mean, it's complicated, but it's kind of callous disregard for what they knew would be outbreaks of this virus in homeless shelters. There's a lot of homeless people in San Francisco. Nobody is surprised that it's happening now, but uh, nobody's being held accountable that they knew this and didn't do anything about it. And, and I think the same is true of the prisons right now. My God, how can one more day go by when we are um, not caring about the plight of people who work in the prisons and people who are in prison in the prisons around this virus. Uh, it's terrible. We're creating death uh, uh, pods. It's, uh, and it won't be enough to let people out for a little bit if we don't reform the entire system. This is, this is where we have to be vigilant, I think. Um, I've become really persuaded uh, by Alice Walker's, uh, Alice Walker, Angela Davis's book, Are Prisons Obsolete? Um, because she's, questioning whether or not our whole system of uh, how we treat criminals or criminalizing uh, is, uh, is inevitable. Why can't we change it? it so, well, uh, it's an extension of slavery the way we're it doing is. it. Is and now for-profit prisons, even more. Right. right. So go and get Angela Davis, our yeah. prisons obsolete, um, because this is our chance to change how people are incarcerated. Mm -hmm. You know, it, 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 it's not inevitable that it's the only solution to uh, social ills, but we've settled on it as if it can't even be interrogated as a question. Well, we, can't, we have to have them, right? No, we don't. No, we don't. We actually well, don't. It's, it's, and it's completely unacceptable in the richest country in the world for anyone, anyone to be without health care, anyone to be without mm -hmm. housing, anyone to be without food. And we're talking about a lot of people. We have to really shift the moral narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we have to um, really start speaking up about that. And there are so many ways in our, in our churches and our organizations that we can say, you know, okay, everybody call the sheriff. Let everybody out of jail. You know, there are these small <laughs> things we can do. Everybody write postcards to elect this person who's going to advocate for change. So we have this opportunity now, I think. I think 
many of us walk around thinking this entire system is so unsustainable. It's unsustainable for the planet and it's unsustainable for my heart because I can't bear to see another homeless person. We, we can't sustain the system. I can't think about the people in for-profit prisons making four cents an hour working for corporations who are putting the fruit of their labor to their shareholders who are getting dividends. That's the kind of system we live in. It's just as evil as the system of slavery that our economic system and political systems are based on. So this is a great opportunity. The apocalypse means the uncovering and we are in the mm -hmm. apocalypse now. All, all manner of things are thus being dissolved, right? As oh, the Bible yes. says. Yeah. Right? So the, let's dissolve them. You know, let's not have them dissolve us. Well, everything is being revealed, is what's happening. So right? it's the time to act. Yeah, 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 yeah. And action is not to address the symptom. Yes. Yeah. To really reevaluate. Yeah. Uh, and I doing. think the myth of the United States being the richest country in the world, when you look at the quality of life, and you include that in understanding of richness. Mm -hmm. um, the quality of life for people in the US, for many millions of people in the US, right. it's not the richest country in the world. Well, it has the most money, Diane. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> it's but just how much unequally, be? uh, you know, because there's an idea of scarcity. Oh, we don't have enough. Well, we have plenty. We just haven't, we haven't, we, exactly. we're giving it all to the, wealthiest people. That's what I meant. Okay, That's so what, what, meant. what we're talking about is not quality. Exactly. We're talking just about right. money, which has, like, means what in this day and age? Well, uh, but, but please, please understand, I'm saying there's so much money. Right. That there's enough for us to have no homeless people. The no health care. No Absolutely. people without health care. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things that we realized, um, we, we work, in, as many of our churches do, uh, with uh, a community center, a meal program that's still continuing in the midst of, of COVID, um, and a food pantry. And we've seen those numbers go up quite a bit because we have new folks that are now finding themselves in food insecure situations. Um, one of the things that, that uh, what happened here locally is that we, we got this money uh, in to put folks up in hotels, uh, to place them in hotels. And so that's, you know, so it sounded like some, some good information and it's really working well for the folks who have gotten in uh, to help keep people from being able to, to, to be more susceptible to, to uh, contracting the virus. Um, and so I called this weekend because we still have a great number of folks that are still at the church every day uh, to give meals. And, and our problem with that is the majority of folks are riding the public transit there and there's no way to socially distance in public transit. And, and just how do we help get folks in a safe location? We will still take the meals to them to make sure they have what they need, but how do we do this? And so um, the, the responses we got um, were they need to go through their case manager well, that works. Okay. So what do I do with the folks who don't, because most of the folks who have case manager have now been placed. Now, what do I do with the remaining people that don't have a case manager, don't have a relationship? And the responses I got were, well, send them to this other local organization that's government funded that provides case management services. And this is the, the county's hotline that, that's supposed to be dealing with this. And I, I had to alert them to the fact that that organization is shut down right now because of COVID. They don't have anybody there. Um, and, and, you know, so it's just this big, vicious cycle. We've got this thing that's available, but we're not making it available to people. And the problem that I had with that is we've now put the folks who aren't housed or aren't placed in, in some form or made some form of temporary uh, housing available to them. We've now taken, we think of, of third world countries and people that don't have access to running water. We've now taken these folks and taken their access to running water because all of the city parks and bathrooms have closed. All of the local businesses there they could have stopped in and used the bathroom have closed. Everywhere they can go in and get access to running water is now closed. So now you've taken another small subset of the population and said, you know what, we really don't care about you. And if right. you get sick and die from this, we don't care. We took right. we took away the resources you had. So instead of giving resource, we've taken it away. Right. And I think that's something we just get, we, we see 
Um, on a small scale here, I see this, oh, well, we've put money into this project and this program that's fixing everything, and that's the perception, but then in reality, it's not actually happening the way that it's being perceived. Um, and I don't fault the young lady I talked to on the phone or the supervisor I talked to on the phone. They're just giving me the resources that have been made available to them. Uh, but it's much like this this uh, uh, Payroll Protection Act that came out and the money that came along with that. I think you said, Reverend Matulski, you tried to, to, to apply for it and, and to no avail. Uh, we've done a similar thing here, and that just hasn't worked uh, because- I think that money is going to prove, that, a lot of that money is going to prove to be mythical as yeah, well I mean, as inadequate. You know, yeah, and now we're saying it's out. We're, we've, we've spent it all. And so we, we put this thing out there, but we didn't put the resource out there to make it actually feasible. Um, and so I think that's the other big issue we see ourselves uh, getting into is just we, we don't put the work into rolling it out on the ground. Or maybe that's intentional and we just don't want it to work. We don't want to spend the money if we don't tell you. You know, I could go out and say, you know what, we're going to offer a, a million dollar scholarship uh, every year. Well, if I don't give you any way to apply for it, then I can say that all day long. It just, it never goes anywhere and I don't have to spend a million dollars. Well, and, and I think some of this gets to what Jim was saying about, y y we have to change the system. The system mm -hmm. is not really interested in helping uh, the least of these. We mm -hmm. have to change the system so that, you know, what we believe about everybody deserves to live uh, reaches the highest level and that means people have to vote and and exercise political power and 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 pressure our elected officials you know we we all need to be getting on the phone to our elected officials and saying that this situation is unacceptable mm -hmm. so karen you've really modeled i think uh in your very political tuesdays with tillis uh yes. theories of uh, for a couple of years now i guess uh, I forget how many Tuesdays in a row. The inauguration, 169 weeks. Oh my God! <laughs> a weekly witness that um, holds your elected official accountable. You're like, and it's so that's a replicable kind of uh, protest, and th it's time for more of that. Uh, we, uh, and you've demonstrated that you get how many? 30, 40, 50 people a week. Not the same people necessarily? Sometimes a couple hundred, depending on the topic. But you did this when you were pastoring. You were also doing a Wednesday witness. Talk yeah, about that. In uh, Needham, Massachusetts, at the Congregation yeah. Church where I was the pastor, um, we had a weekly gathering on the town green. So this is New England, right? Um, so reclaiming a public space that was originally a place for public uh, dissent. Uh, and it was for the separated children to protest uh, Trump's separated children policy. Uh, and we should be even more outraged now with what's happening to immigrants, yes. just like yes. prisoners who are also yes. being detained. Uh, yes. So, you know, Needham was a very upper middle class, uh, not, not very political the community, and the Congregational Church is not that political. But this issue of the children did motivate them. And we eventually would have on a regular basis, 30, 40, 50 people gathering just for a half an hour every Wednesday, uh, on the town green in front of the town hall. So we created a visibility that was not otherwise uh, happening around the children who are separated from their families because it's not, it was not being created at higher levels. You know, the, what happened to ch children uh, was concealed, not revealed, um, I think. And that's why it's partly still able to go on. So our role as religious people is to create these micro uh, communities of resistance. Yes. In order Witness. to bring to attention what the dominant culture does not want us to see. Right. Um, and that's we're, that's what we do. That's in our wheelhouse. That's we what do. church is. We're not, uh, uh, you know, unconcerned or inattentive to what's happening. And that means church has to be political. I mean, I, I really want to urge uh, my pastor colleagues who are on this call um, or who might watch it Every week, church should have something that draws attention. You should be able to tell what's happening in the world by what happens in your service. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it can't be a period piece mm -hmm. in order to provide you know, comfort and healing for people. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, thinking about some full of resources today because I wasn't sure what to do. Um, this is a book that we use uh, in worship uh, at every church I've ever uh, mm -hmm. uh, served over the last 
30 years, I think. And it's the social, civil rights songs from um, the civil rights movement. Many of them are based in, uh, in religious songs, but they have verses uh, that address the situation. Uh, so I'm thinking of Keep Your Eyes on the Prize, uh, which is one we used every week for Black History Month in Foster City, California at the Carnational Church. Uh, Paul and Silas, bound in jail, had no money for to go there bail. Keep your eyes on the prize, hold on, hold on. So there are these phrases in it. Um, we're gonna board that big greyhound, carrying love from town to town. Uh, but the one thing we did wrong was the day we started, or uh, no, it is. The only thing we did wrong stayed in the wilderness a day too long. Uh. <laughs> but the one thing we did right was the day we started to fight. Yes. This is what we should be seeing in church. Yes, yes. It should be the, should be the earworm in our, when we leave church right yeah. now, not in the garden, which I also like. But yes. Uh, is our worship of politicizing, uh, is it functioning to politicize us? I, I think this is an important question for us. It, it's not to, we shouldn't avoid politics. We should intentionally seek to raise consciousness uh, about what's happening. So I think that this is, our, this is the legacy we bring to the coronavirus right now. It yeah. can't just be all about comfort and prayer. It should right. be like that. But people can handle it. And, and, I, and I, want to, I want to get back to Diane's qual, uh, uh, point about quality of life, because that's really important. Um, and I think that the people who are saying, oh, I can't stand it. I'm not watching the news. It's too depressing. And, and also are not taking some actions around our outrageous immigration policy, our racism, uh, you know, the things that are just literally killing people off. If we're not fighting, then we're not happy. We're just getting more and more depressed because we know in our hearts that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I know it's hard to look at. I know it's hard to look at the president and his policies and what's happening to our country. And we have to look at it because it only through it, only if we walk through it together, can can we um, can we get to the other side? And that's a profoundly, you know, biblical idea. <laughs> yes. Love the cat. Yes, yes. This is like a camera hog. <laughs> you know, in the middle of the Easter church service, uh, or. <laughs> Want to be where I am, so I <laughs> keep. We've become a little symbiotic in our four weeks of quarantine now. <laughs> now wasn't it uh, Coretta Scott King that said silence is violence, uh, or something that there thereabouts that that you know when we are silent, when we we realize that there are issues and we don't do something about them, that that our inaction can be equally as harming as the oppressors that are going out there and actively trying to do harm. And silence equals death was the, right. was the right. model of ACT UP. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it still is. So I, I want to reach back to one other cultural influence that mm -hmm. I think can be useful in our pol ongoing pol politicization. Um, how we processed grief and how we talked about it, how we turned it into art often. I think um, could be another strategy for us to revisit right now. Uh, and I'm thinking of the AIDS novels and uh, the AIDS- um, Quilt. Quilt, things like that. Uh, Sarah Shulman's uh, book, People in Trouble, um, was all about uh, ACT UP, really. And I just want to read one little quote from it because I think it contains uh, something for us. There is a euphoria in taking control of your own life. There is something crippling that occurs when the response to that act distorts it. As long as the people fighting for change are smaller than the institutions that control information, their activities will be misrepresented, their impact minimized, and their humanity questioned. The only way to overcome the machinery is to become bigger than it is. So yeah. that one day, more people will be participating in the event than watching it on television. That is called a revolution. In the meantime, yeah. we are placated with the condition of free speech uh, in a nation of no ideas. So it's a little cynical, but uh, the, the idea that uh, we have to be bigger right. than the election. This is right. how we know we're doing it. Right. Uh, and this coronavirus has everything about it. Uh, our, our response to it can lull us into 
a state that we can't afford to be in. Right. Paying attention to what's happening with civil liberties, uh, paying attention to what's happening with voting rights. Right. Uh, uh, the disease itself is horrible. And that can't deter us from, uh, you know, ongoing action. This is the time. Yeah. Yeah. And churches can join with various coalitions. Like I know we will have one in North Carolina that's working on all of these fronts, the prisons, uh, the migrant workers, the food, uh, people hungry. Like we're, I, I, I think that all this time since the inauguration of Donald Trump, there have been activists rising up and connecting mm -hmm. with each other. It's actually very hopeful to me mm -hmm. um, because now during this time, we're all seeing the same things that need to be done and learning how to work together to do them. Mm -hmm. So everything has prepared us for this. I think our history as an LGBTQ people has prepared us for this. And I feel a lot more prepared than a lot of people who didn't live through that, that time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I also feel more prepared for it than people who don't know what it feels like to be a uh, queer or, or a person of color or, you know, we're out of step with the dominant culture. We know we'll never fit in, you know? So we've always wanted to uh, have the kind of world where everyone is included, regardless of their disability, their mm -hmm. amount of money, their whatever. You know, we want that world just by virtue of who we are. And I think MCC has always shown us how to create that beloved community that Martin Luther mm -hmm. King talked about, the community that looks like a whole lot of people that some people might think of as misfits, but mm -hmm. hey, the last shall be first. And we know that's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are 10 churches every Sunday in the town where your MCC church is that uh, will discourage a politicized approach to how to respond to coronavirus. There needs to be one that, uh, that consistently messages, this is a political crisis. Yeah. And we can play a role in shaping what happens next. Right. Because mm -hmm. one thing I will say is that we absolutely have to get Donald Trump out of office and Mitch mm -hmm. McConnell out of office. We absolutely have to. For the future of the planet, for the future of our constitution and our democracy, we absolutely have to. And so what's, what's uh, being uncovered is the incredible mismanagement and lack of qualifications, to say the least, of this president um, and, and, and then there's a counter narrative and a whole lot of propaganda coming in the other direction. So we need to keep lifting up the truth. We need to keep just lifting up the truth. Yeah. Um, so we're at uh, just over an hour. So I do want to, to try to keep us to that uh, time frame just to, to make sure that we're respectful of everybody's time. Um, and, and as I, I shared with, with y'all before we joined the call, we can certainly continue this conversation if we think we need to do another one of these. I, I, you know, part of this is to make sure that we get the information out there. There's so much misinformation that's being uh, shared. And um, there's so many questions. And I think that, that leaders, faith community leaders, organizations uh, are looking for ways to, to navigate this and what we should do. Uh, one of the questions I had asked, uh, yeah, and y'all hit on this quite a bit uh, throughout, is what we as faith communities, what we as faith leaders can be doing now? What can we take away? And a couple of things that, that you've mentioned so far, uh, one was to make sure that we're including this in our conversations with our communities through sermons or through worship, through, through our communication, just making sure that we do recognize um, and I think maybe it's important if we don't realize uh, maybe the political aspect of this to ask questions, to find out why and what we should do. There's tons of resources out there um, for us to be able to, to reach out and, and get. Um, and so, so just having that conversation. And then the other thing that, that I've heard us mention a couple of times in here, but and I think it's become such a commonly used term that I fear that people don't take uh, the, the urgency of this and it's to get out and vote, um, to educate yourselves and get out and vote. Um, and, and I think, uh, Reverend Ziegler, what was it? 54, 56% of the, the country's population voting population that voted in the last election, last presidential it, it election. Was, I think it was lower than that. And I just, hey. can I just add one more thing is yeah. I think all our churches need to be 
connected with the Poor People's Campaign, Reverend mm, William yes. Barber, Repairs mm. of the Breach of the Poor People's Campaign. I know you are, Vance, um, mm. and I really appreciate that so much. Just we need to every one of us join the Poor People's Campaign because he is really knowing how to talk about changing the moral narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so getting connected with the Poor People's Campaign. What other ways, so, so making sure folks know to get out and vote, talking about the issues and not being afraid of them, getting connected with folks like the Poor People's Campaign Repairs of the Breach um, and a few others that are out there. What other things can our churches do? Um, and I, I wanted to make sure that we highlight, um, we talked a bit about this before we started the call. Um, I think sometimes we can get ourselves into a place where we think, well, my church is only a few members, so there's not a lot we can do. Uh, and I think that's a really big myth that, you know, Jesus started uh, the, the modern church with, what, 12 disciples that we read about. And so, I mean, us <laughs> belittling our power based on our numbers, I think, is a major uh, distractor. So, but what would you say from the church that, that meets every Sunday with six people to the church that's meeting every Sunday with 6,000, what can we do uh, to be able to get out there and make sure uh, that we're doing everything we can? I, you know, we, we have a lot of things that we do as part of our DNA that we don't always apply to social justice issues. We can learn, we can be literate about public health and about uh, economics and about politics. Uh, from a religious perspective, we, we can, we gather for education. We do Bible teaching in our worship. Maybe we should be doing teaching about some of these other issues uh, mm -hmm. as well. We make coalitions uh, as part of our uh, culture. And this has got to be uh, a time where coalitions survive the immediate crisis in order for us to deal with the systemic issues. Right. And we give money. I mean, yeah. every, we, we collect money. I'm a fundraiser. I, I do development work in my uh, uh, besides pastory and um, cr church people. Every week we pass a plate as well as uh, create opportunities for giving. We should be giving money away right now right. Uh, in addition to collecting it and not falling into that trap that um, a lot of the church growth that many of us bought into in the 80s and 90s uh, literature did, which was to say, I think it was C. Peter Wagner, to distinguish between social services and social justice. Mm -hmm. Growing churches provide social services, food banks, things like that. And those are good things. Um, but the church growth people said uh, liberal churches that provide or that encourage social justice, they're dying out. And we can't afford to dichotomize in that way. Right. Uh, it's it's got to be both together. It, integrated. It's got to be both. So that's... And, I, and I do think that for the small churches, I pastor small, a small church right now. If we're going to have a future... It's because we engage issues like this, right, and and increase our sense of agency, right, uh, and uh, and our visibility. Not because we offer a refuge from that. You yes, know, people would say, "Oh, I just I need a place to go on Sunday where I don't hear about these <laughs> things." <clears throat> That's not church. That's a cemetery. No. That's a park. Also, you know, uh, but uh, church is the place where you leave fired up to make a difference. <laughs> I mean, I believe that. I love that. I love that. I love that. And and just also, you know, we are essentially living in a culture that is like Nazi Germany. It is a genocidal culture. Mm -hmm. uh, I, right. mean, I could detail that, but I'm not going to. But, you know, so, so all of us, I think, have an unease in our hearts. And there's a burden in our hearts. And maybe some of us, it's about homelessness. Some of us, it's about immigrants. Some of it's about prisons. I don't know. But each of us, some of us, the environment, you know, our connection with nature. So, so I think that part of, the, part of what pastors need to do is find out what is that burden on your heart and, and feed that interest. Say, well, yeah, you know, let's look into that. Let's look into what's happening in the prison. Let's, or let's look into what's happening in the environment and how we can mm -hmm. um, put all of our weight behind this. If we follow our interest and our hearts, and, and if as spiritual leaders, we help each other's individual unfolding, help us be more of who we are and bring, bring our voice, amplify each other's voice so that we can increasingly bring our queer voices into the world. Mm -hmm. We will be supporting the new world and, and, and helping this corrupt system to fall. 
there is an inevitability to a new order. Uh, yes. I think that the, yes. the, the, the structure of the funding yes. that benefits uh, businesses and corporations, they know that. Yes. We're not going to go back in July or August or September to whatever it was we were doing in March. Right. Uh, that includes church and that includes many other things. So let's get with the program rather right. than watch it happen to us. Uh, right. 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 AIDS changed us forever. Mm -hmm. This will change us even more. Yes. And yes. since this is an MCC thing, church is going to look different. Christianity is having a moment, uh, <laughs> as it has every now and then. Uh, uh, this is one of them. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know that people are ever going to come back to church, to be honest, in the numbers that they once did, if what we offer them is what we have been offering them. Uh, the steady decline of American Protestantism. Uh, this is our chance to say, no, we're not ready to give up yet. We're not dying. Mm -hmm. uh, not only do we want to get through coronavirus, virus, but we want to, we want to thrive in a new way, in a meaningful, right. and relevant way. Right. Mm -hmm. And the stories in the Bible give us everything we need in order to right. do that. It's true. Yeah. I do think a lot of our churches are finding a new um, normal and. Right. That things, uh, the message that's going out from our churches right now, it's talking about how we can do things differently. Yeah. And a number of our churches are actually the people that are attending and the viewing. They've got a much larger exposure range because we are going out there online and we can be more political in that way from that place because they are getting out there and they are going um, because we are online and that makes a huge difference. You know, we've been de in decline in MCC in Northern California for many years. Painful because it was once a stronghold numerically, right? We have a third the number of churches here now that we once had. Wow. It, on Good Friday that we had like a, a joint service with the seven remaining churches in Northern California. And it's not like the technology was for, that allowed us to do this. Uh, it was created on, you know, Monday, Thursday. We ha could have been doing this all along. Now, now we did this because we had to. We gathered seven churches for virtual worship on Good Friday, and it was far better than anything we could have done. And this <laughs> is part of what church looks like, you know, anything we could have done singly. Right. Uh, so let's learn from it. You know, if we go back to only in-person worship, uh, work. and if we let distances, distance is meaningless now. Not right. meaningless, but it doesn't right. mean what it once did. We really had a hundred people, I would say, uh, from seven churches all over Northern California, together. Mm -hmm. We haven't done that. We haven't done that in years, mm -hmm. and uh, it made me realize, oh, it's it's not dead yet. It's bigger than it used to be, and it, <laughs> or there's more there than we think. Yes, we have yes. people that are coming that couldn't get physically to a church. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, we have people that are joining <clears throat> churches around the country. Mm -hmm. um, finding what works for them, hearing the, the messages and calling them out and saying, you know, okay, we can do this here, but it's out there where we're going to live it. And I think that, that that's a part of what we've got to do now, even though we're sort of confined by social distancing <clears throat> and staying at home, we still can have an impact out there, a huge impact if we use it well. Right. Let's not stay away from the issues that uh, people are afraid to address in church because they might be divisive. I'm going to name one that's going to perhaps make us uncomfortable, but it's the kind of thing we should be talking about. End of life. Uh, yeah, we are so doing A couple of states have it, have legal ways for people to choose an end to their lives. And most states do not. And the Christian church is noticeably absent from this conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, and what's happening with coronavirus? People are dying They're, who have not thought about their mortality. This happened to us in AIDS. We need to be the place that you can talk about death, uh, about mortality, about ending your own life in a thoughtful, dignified way if you do not choose to suffer needlessly, um, rather than have it be one of those things we don't talk about and, mm -hmm. and surrender uh, to a secular society. It's coming up on our agenda in Delaware. <clears throat> as a, a thing going before the house, it sort of got stopped because of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. But it's been a really important conversation in the Rehoboth area because of 
the nature of our community, which is mostly retired people. And the right to choose. Uh, it's not just the right to choose whether we're <clears throat> pregnant or not pregnant. It's the right to choose if we choose to end our lives, if we choose to continue with our lives. It's all about, it's, it's linked in a lot of ways to everything we do around choice. Um, mm -hmm. And this is, this is one more thing that we need to say, this is, this is my, my choice, it's my body, um, and we have rights to do with it what we will. And somehow it feels again tied to the economic thing. Like if we choose to end our life, what happens? Uh, well, who's not getting money from us? Um, so I think that there, it covers all of those different areas. When we've been talking in community, it's covered everything when we look at end of life conversations. I, I, I think it is all connected. I just want to say that I, I always get nervous about this conversation in the context of a society that does not care for those who are ill and those who are dying um, right. very well. And, and so I, you know, I was a hospice nurse. Uh, I, I saw a lot of people die as a pastor and as a nurse. And I do think there's a very mysterious uh, process of unbinding of the soul from the body, and and I and I and sometimes it's it's difficult um, and it takes a long time. And when you are caring for someone who's dying like that, sometimes you just finally you just want the person to die. But but that's a natural <laughs> that's a natural response to caring for someone who's dying. And if you can just live through that, um, you know, sometimes you only can let someone go because you've reached that point that, that you just can't. So what I just want to say about that is when we are a society that really does care for everyone, I'll be more comfortable with, you know, people end their lives. I think sometimes people end their life because we're not caring for them and we're not giving them you know, the right pain medicine or whatever. That's just my own little tirade. But I love, I love that we need to look at our own death. We need to look at our own death. That's such a spiritually rich thing to do. Mm -hmm. It really makes us very mindful of the moment. It, it, it gives us a real practice of gratitude. Um, and, and yes, I, I, I totally think that's right. Mm -hmm. We're in such a death denying culture. Mm -hmm. Well, on that happy note, Pastor Vance, yeah. Yes, I'm going to end the conversation there. Uh, uh, we are, uh, ironically enough, we've talked a great deal about um, uh, the health care side of things today. We are tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, going to hold a, another conversation with uh, Dr. Uh, David Williams, uh, who's also the pastor at Christ Liberator uh, in New Jersey, Metropolitan Community Church, um, who is one of the physicians uh, in the health care system there in New Jersey, who is uh, battling the COVID virus every day. Um, and uh, in the conversation I've had with him in the last few days, he's uh, playing double duty because the chaplains aren't allowed in, in the ICUs where people are dying every day from the COVID virus. So he's uh, going in with his stolen and, and offering last rites and, and uh, last wishes for people as they're dying um, and being their doctor at the same time. And so that, and several other of his colleagues are doing the same thing. Uh, and, and he's going to be joined also, um, uh, we're going to have the uh, Dr. Ernest Grant, who is the president of the American Nurses Association. Oh, he's great. Uh, and so, yes, um, and so glad to have them tomorrow. We're going to talk a lot about health care, focusing primarily on the, the misinformation that's out there and how, um, you know, some of the facts about COVID-19 and, and what we as faith communities need to be doing to share that with our uh, people as well. And so uh, if you have time, join us tomorrow for that. Uh, and then we'll continue this conversation again next week. Um, we, we didn't get much into the economic impact that we see or that we're expecting to see. I think that's really going to be the next bell curve that we really start watching. Um, right. That's uh, economic impact of, of folks that are uh, going to be severely struggling here in the next few weeks. Um, that's going to change philanthropy so, on every level. Yeah. Yes. And we're going to change, what did you say? Well, we've, and that's something we've been needing to do. Yes. But uh, the, the ways that we have raised money in the past are going to be toast. Uh, and, yeah. uh, you know, 
and and money might be toast. I mean, you know, there's so many yeah. things uh, that that will be different. But as Christians, we bring values and ethics to all these questions. There's right. no topic that isn't susceptible to uh, religious interpretation. We just got to make sure that it's not, you know, crazy religion uh, only. That is <laughs> yeah. Well, and maybe, maybe this is, uh, as Reverend Fisher pointed out, uh, I, you know, to rephrase some some of what you said, maybe, I, I think maybe the, the church, maybe us as Christians, maybe us as faith leaders or faith communities have, have gone back into some form of closets, and this is now forcing us back out of those closets, um, much different than the closets, you know, we, we formally talk about, but I think maybe this is bringing us out of a closet. Uh, where we talk about things we wouldn't have talked about before, where we look at embracing the technology that's there that brings us together across great distances. Um, and so this is, you know, that, that's some of the things that we can embrace as we go through this together. So thank you all for taking time to join thank us. Thank you, you, thank you. Reverend Fisher, for joining us. Thank, oh, thank you so you. much. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you, Reverend Zebra, and for the two, nearly 200 weeks that you have been out there at the, the, the Federal House. Thank you so much for that work, and thank you, Reverend Matulski, for everything you're doing. Um, and what, what's the cat's name? We've seen him two well, weeks is, now. So this I... is Keats, named after the English poet John Keats. Okay, <laughs> yes. So we look forward to seeing Keats as well. On the show. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Oh, oh, goodness, look, there's another. <laughs> You can't control them. I, I mean, it's, that's fine. No, they're cat. It's a cat. You yes. have a contribution. You just don't understand it yet. So, <laughs> thank so you. Thank y'all so much thank for the work so you're much. doing. God thank bless you. you. And we'll talk soon. Thank you. All right. Bye bye.